Chapter 35 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. Why should two hearts in one breast lie and yet not lodge together? O oh, love, where is thy sympathy? if thus our breasts you seever well did you like the gallery asks mrs monkton throwing aside her book to greet joyce as she returns from doré's it is next day and barbara had let the girl go to see the pictures without telling her of her meeting with felix the evening before she had been afraid to say anything about him lest that guilty secret of hers might transpire that deliberate betrayal of joyce's intended visit to bond street on the morrow if joyce had heard that she would in all probability have defeated her going there for ever and it was such a chance mrs monkton who in her time had said so many hard words about matchmakers as most women have and who would have scorned to be classed with them had promoted and desired this meeting of felix and joyce with all the energy and enthusiasm of which she was capable but that joyce should suspect her of the truth is a fear that terrifies her very much so did tommy he's very graphic in his remarks says joyce sinking listlessly into a chair and taking off her hat she looks vexed and preoccupied i think he gave several very original ideas on the subjects of the pictures to doze around they seemed impressed you know how far above the foolish feeling mauvaise honte he is his voice like a silver clarion rung excelsior was outdone everybody turned and looked at him with i hope he was noisy says mrs monkton nervously with admiration i was going to say but you wouldn't let me finish my sentence oh yes he was quite a success one old gentleman wanted to know if he would accept the part of art critic in his paper it was very exciting she leans back in her chair the troubled look on her face growing intensified she seems glad to be silent and with downcast eyes plays with the gloves lying in her lap something has happened joyce says her sister going over to her something is happening always returned joyce with a rather impatient smile yes but to you just now you are sure to make me tell you sooner or later says miss kavanagh and even if i didn't tommy would i met mr dysart at that gallery to-day felix says mrs monkton feeling herself an abominable hypocrite yet afraid to confess the truth something in the girl's whole attitude forbids the confession at this moment at all events yes well well he was glad to see you darling very tenderly was he i don't know he looked very ill he said he had had a bad cough he's coming to see you you were kind to him joyce i didn't personally insult him if you mean that oh no i don't mean that you know what i mean he was ill unhappy you did not make him more unhappy it is always for him cries the girl with jealous anger is there never to be a thought for me am i nothing to you am i never unhappy why don't you ask if he was kind to me was he ever unkind well you can forget he said dreadful things to me dreadful i'm not likely to forget them if you are after all they did not hurt you joyce yes i know i know everything you would say i am ungrateful abominable but he was unkind to me he said what no girl would ever forgive and yet you have not one angry word for him never mind all that says mrs monkton soothingly tell me what you did to-day what you said as little as possible defiantly i tell you i don't want ever to see him again or hear of him i think i hate him and he looked dying she stops here as if finding a difficulty about saying another word she coughs nervously then recovering herself and as if determined to assert herself anew and show how real is the coldness that she has declared yes dying i think she says stubbornly 
oh i don't think he looked as bad as that says barbara hastily unthinkingly filled with grief not only at this summary dismissal of poor felix from our earthly sphere but for her sister's unhappiness which is as plain to her as though no little comedy had been performed for the concealment of it you don't repeats joyce lifting her head and directing a piercing glance at her you what do you know about him why you just said stammers mrs monkton and then breaks down ignominiously you knew he was in town says joyce advancing to her and looking down on her with clasped hands and a pale face barbara speak you knew he was here and never told me you with a sudden fresh burst of inspiration sent him to that place to-day to meet me oh no dearest no indeed he himself can tell you it was only that he asked where i was going to at such and such an hour and you told him she is still standing over poor mrs monkton in an attitude that might almost be termed menacing i didn't i assure you joyce you are taking it all quite wrongly it was only oh only only says the girl contemptuously do you think i can't read between the lines i'm sure you believe you are sticking to the honest truth barbara but still well bitterly i don't think he profited much by the information you gave him your deception has given him small satisfaction i don't think you should speak to me like that says mrs monkton in a voice that trembles perceptibly i don't care what i say cries joyce with a sudden burst of passion you betray me he betrays me all the world seem arrayed against me and what have i done to anybody she throws out her hands protestingly joyce darling if you would only listen listen i am always listening it seems to me to him to you to every one i am tired of being silent i must speak now i trusted you barbara and you have been bad to me do you want to force him to make love to me that you tell him on the very first opportunity where to find me and in a place where i am without you or anyone to will you try to understand says mrs monkton with a light stamp of her foot her patience going as her grief increases he cross-examined me as to where you were and what would be and i i told him i wasn't going to make a mystery of it or you was i i told him that you were going to the doré gallery to-day with tommy how could i know he would go there to meet you he never said he was going you are unjust joyce both to him and to me do you mean to tell me that for all that you didn't know he would be at that place to-day turning flashing eyes upon her sister how could i know unless a person says a thing right out how is one to be sure what he is going to do oh that is unlike you it is unworthy of you says joyce turning from her scornfully you did know and it is not turning back again and confronting the now thoroughly frightened barbara with a glance full of pathos it is not that your insincerity that hurt me so much it is i didn't mean to be insincere you are very cruel you do not measure your words you will tell me next that you meant it all for the best with a bitter smile that is the usual formula isn't it well never mind perhaps you did what i object to is you didn't tell me that i was kept designedly in the dark both by him and you am i with sudden fire a child or fool that you should seek to guide me so blindly well drawing a long breath i won't keep you in the dark when i left the gallery and your protege i met mr beauclerc mrs monkton stunned by this intelligence remained silent for a full minute it is death to her hopes if she has met that man again it is impossible to know how things have gone his fatal influence her unfortunate infatuation for him all will be ruinous to poor felix's hopes you spoke to him asked she at last in an emotionless tone yes was felix with you when when you met that odious man mr beauclerc 
no i dismissed mr dyside as soon as ever i could no doubt and mr beauclerc did you dismiss him as promptly certainly not there was no occasion no inclination either you were kind to him at all events it is only to the man who is honest and sincere that you are deliberately uncivil i hope i was uncivil to neither of them there is no use giving yourself that air with me joyce you are angry with me but why only because i am anxious for your happiness oh that hateful man how i detest him he has made you unhappy once he will certainly make you unhappy again i don't think so says joyce taking up her hat and first with the evident intention of leaving the room and thus putting an end to the discussion you will never think so until it is too late you haven't the strength of mind to throw him over once and for all and give your thoughts to one who is really worthy of you on the contrary you spend your time comparing him favourably with the good and faithful felix you should put that down it will do for his tombstone says miss kavanagh with a rather uncertain little laugh at all events it would not do for mr beauclerc's tombstone though i wish it would and that i could put it there at once i shall tell freddy to read the commandments to you says joyce with a dreary attempt at mirth you have forgotten your duty to your neighbour it is all true however you can't deny it joyce you are deliberately wilfully throwing away the good for the bad i can't bear to see it i can't look on in silence and see you thus miserably destroying your life how can you be so blind darling appealing to her with hands and voice and eyes such determined folly would be strange in any one stranger far in a girl like you whose sense has always been above suspicion did it ever occur to you asks joyce in a slightly bantering tone that but ill conceals the nervousness that is consuming her that you might be taking a wrong view of the situation that i was not so blind after all that i what was it you said that i spent my nights and days comparing the merits of mr beauclerc with those of your friend felix dysart to your friend's discomfiture now suppose that i did thus waste my time and gave my veto in favour of mr dysart how would it be then it might be so you know for all that he or you or any one could say it is not so light a matter that you should trifle with it says mrs monkton with a faint suspicion of severity in her soft voice no of course not you are right miss kavanagh moves towards the door after all barbara looking back at her that applies to most things in this sad old world what matter under heaven can we poor mortals dare to trifle with not one i think all bear within them the seeds of grief or joy sacred seeds both carrying in their bosoms the germs of eternity even when this life is gone from us we will still face veal or woo still we need not make our own woo says barbara who is a sturdy enemy to all pessimistic thoughts wait a moment joyce she hurries after her and lays her hand on the girl's shoulder will you come with me next wednesday to see lady monkton lady monkton why i thought yes i know i would not take you there before because she had not expressly asked to see you but to-day she made a she sent you a formal message at all events she said she hoped i would bring you when i came again is that all of it asks joyce gazing at her sister with a curious smile that has troubled but has still some growing sense of amusement in it what an involved statement surely you have forgotten something that mr dysart was standing near you for example and will probably find that it is absolutely imperative that he should call on lady monkton next wednesday too don't set your heart on that barbara i think after my interview with him to-day he will not want to see lady monkton next wednesday End of chapter thirty five recording by monica rolly Chapter thirty six of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford Chapter 36 Children know very little, but their capacity of comprehension is great. I've just been interviewing Tommy on the subject of the pictures, says Mr. Monkton. So far as I can make out, he disapproves of Dory. Oh, Tommy, and all such beautiful pictures out of the Bible, says his mother. I did like them, says Tommy, only some of them were queer. I wanted to know about them, but nobody would tell me, and... Why, Tommy, I explained them all to you, says Joyce, reproachfully. You did in the first two little rooms, and in the big room afterward, where the velvet seats were. They, looking at his father and raising his voice to an indignant note, wouldn't let me run around on the top of them. Good heavens, says Mr. Monkton, can that be true? Truly this country is going to the dogs. Where do the dogs live? asks Tommy. What dogs? Why does the country want to go to them? It doesn't want to go, explains his father, but it will have to go, and the dogs will punish them for not letting you reduce its velvet seats to powder. Never mind, go on with your story, so that unnatural aunt of yours won't tell you about the pictures, eh? She did in the beginning, and when we got into the big room too, a little while, she told me about the great large one at the end, Christ and the historian, though I couldn't see the historian anywhere, and she herself must be a most successful one, says Mr. Monkton, sotto voce. And then we came to the innocents, and I perfectly hated that, says Tommy. Twice frightful. Everybody was as large as that, stretching out his arms and puffing out his cheeks, and the babies were all so fat and so horrid. And then Felix came, and Joyce had to talk to him, so I didn't know any more. I think you forgot, says Joyce. There was that picture with lions in it. Mr. Dysart himself explained that to you. Oh, that one, says Tommy, as if dimly remembering. The circus one, the one with the round house. I didn't like that either. It is rather ghastly for a child, says his mother. That's not the one with the gas, puts in Tommy. The one with the gas is just close to it and has got Pilates wife in it. She's very nice. But why didn't you like the other? asks his father. I think it one of the best there. Well, I don't, says Tommy, evidently grieved at having to differ from his father, but filled with a virtuous determination to stick to the truth through thick and thin. No? Tis unfair, says Tommy, that has been allowed for centuries says his father then why don't they change it change what asked mr monkton feeling a little puzzled how can one change now the detestable cruelties or the abominable habits of the dark ages but why were they dark asked tommy mamma says they had gas then i didn't mean that i his mother is beginning, but Monkton stops her with a despairing gesture. Don't, says he. It would take a good hour by the slowest clock. Let him believe there was electric light, then, if he chooses. Well, but why can't they change it, persists Tommy, who is evidently full of the picture in question. I have told you. But the painter man could change it. I'm afraid not, Tommy. He is dead. Why didn't he do it before he died, then? Why didn't somebody show him what to do? I don't fancy he wanted any hints, and besides, he had to be true to his ideal. It was a terrible time. They did really throw the Christians to the lions, you know. 
of course i know that says tommy with a superior air but why didn't they cast another one eh says mr monkton that's why it's unfair says tommy there's one poor lion there and he hasn't got any christian why didn't mr dory give him one tabot barbara said mr monkton faintly after a long pause is there any brandy in the house but barbara is looking horrified it is shocking she says why should he take such a twisted view of it he has always been a kind-hearted child and now well he has been kind-hearted to the lions says mr monkton no one can deny that oh if you persist in encouraging him freddy says his wife with tears in her eyes believe me barbara breaks in joyce at this moment it is a mistake to be soft-hearted in this world there is something bright but uncomfortable in the steady gaze she directs at her sister one should be hard if one means to live comfortably will you take me soon again to see pictures asks tommy running to joyce and scrambling upon the seat she is occupying do but if you dislike them so much only some and other places may be funnier what day will you take me i don't think i shall again make an arrangement beforehand says joyce rising and placing tommy on the ground very gently some morning just before we start you and i we will make our plans she does not look at barbara this time but her tone is eloquent barbara looks at her however with eyes full of reproach end of chapter thirty six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirty seven of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter thirty seven love is its own great loveliness always and takes new beauties from the touch of time in bow owes no december and no may but bears its blossoms into winter's clime i have often thought what a melancholy world this would be without children oh felix it is you says mrs monkton in a dismayed tone her hansom is at the door and arrayed in her best bib and tucker she is hurrying through the hall when dysart who has just come presents himself he was just coming in in fact as she was going out don't mind me says he there is always to-morrow oh yes but and miss kavanagh it is to recover her i am going out this afternoon it is the next day so soon after her rupture with joyce that she is afraid to even hint at further complications a strong desire to let him know that he might wait and try his fortune once again on her return with joyce is oppressing her mind but she puts it firmly behind her or thinks she does she is lunching at the brabazons she says old friends of ours i promise to lunch there too so as to be able to bring joyce home again she will be back then in an hour and a half at least says mrs monkton who after all is not strong enough to be quite genuine to her better judgments but with a start and a fresh determination to be cruel in the cause of right that would be much too long for you to wait for us i shouldn't think it long says he mrs monkton smiles suddenly at him how charming how satisfactory he is could any lover be more devoted well it would be 
for all that says she but hesitating in a last vain effort to dismiss and then losing herself suppose you do not abandon your visit altogether that you go away now and get your lunch at your club i feel contritely how inhospitable i am and then come back again here about four o'clock she i will have returned by that time an excellent plan says he his face lighting up then it clouds again if she knows i am to be here ah that is a difficulty says mrs monkton her own pretty face showing signs of distress but anyhow risk it i would rather she knew however says he steadily the idea of entrapping her into a meeting with him is abhorrent to him he had had enough of that at the doré gallery though he had been innocent of any intentional deception there i will tell her then says mrs monkton and in the meantime go and get your at this moment the door on the right is thrown open and tommy with a whirr hoop descends upon them followed by mabel oh it's felix cries he joyfully will you stay with us felix we've no one to have dinner with us to-day because mammy is going away and joyce is gone and pappy is nowhere and nurse isn't a bit of good she only says take care you don't choke yourselves my dearies he imitates nurse to the life and dinner will be here in a minute mary says she's going to bring it upstairs oh do do stay with us supplements little mabel thrusting her small hand imploringly into his it is plain that he is in high favor with the children however out of it with certain other members of the family and feeling grateful to them dysart hesitates to say the no that is on his lips how hard it is to refuse the entreaties of these little clinging fingers these eager lovely upturned faces if i may says he at last addressing mrs monkton and thereby giving in oh as for that you know you may says she but you will perfectly hate it it is too bad to allow you to accept their invitation you will be bored to death and you will detest the boiled mutton there is only that and rice i think i won't even be sure of the rice it may be tapioca and that is worse still it's rice says tommy who is great friends with the cook and knows till her secrets that decides the question says felix gravely everyone knows that i adore rice it is my one weakness at this mrs monkton gives way to an irrepressible laugh and he catching the meaning of it laughs too you are wrong however says he that other is my one strength i could not live without it well tommy i accept your invitation i shall stay and lunch dine with you in truth it seems sweet in his eyes to remain in the house that she joyce occupies it will be easier to wait to hope for her return there than elsewhere your blood be on your own head says barbara solemnly if however it goes too far i warn you there are remedies when it occurs to you that life is no longer worth living go to the library you will find there a revolver it is three hundred years old i am told it is hung very high on the wall to keep it out of freddy's reach blow your brains out with it if you can you're awfully good awfully thoughtful says mr dysart but i don't think when the final catastrophe arrives it will be suicide if i must murder somebody it will certainly not be myself it will be either the children or the mutton mrs monkton laughs then turns a serious eye on tommy 
now tommy says she addressing him with a gravity that should have overwhelmed him i am going away from you for an hour or so and mr dysart has kindly accepted your invitation to lunch with him i do hope with increasing impressiveness you will be good i hope so too returns tommy genially there is an astonished pause confined to the elders only and then mr dysart unable to restrain himself any longer bursts out laughing could anything be more candid says he more full of trust in himself and yet with a certain modesty withal there you can go mrs monkton with a clear conscience i am not afraid to give myself up to the open-handed dealing of your son then his tone changes he follows her quickly as she turns from him to the children to bid them good-bye miss kavanagh says he is she well happy she is well says barbara stopping to look back at him with her hand on mabel's shoulder there is reservation in her answer had she any idea that i would call to-day this question is absolutely forced from him how should she even i did not know it certainly i thought you would come some day and soon and she may have thought so too but you should have told me you called too soon impatience is a vice says mrs monkton shaking her head in a very kindly fashion however i suppose when she knows when with a rather sad smile you tell her i am to be here on her return this afternoon she will not come with you oh yes she will i think so i am sure of it but you must understand felix that she is very peculiar difficult is what they call it nowadays and pausing and glancing at him she is angry too about something that happened before you left last autumn i hardly know what i have imagined only and rapidly don't let us go into it but you will know that there was something something yes says he well a trifle probably i have said she is difficult but you failed somewhere and she is slow to pardon where where what does that mean demands the young man a great spring of hope taking life within his eyes ah uh, that hardly matters but she is not forgiving she is the very dearest girl i know but that is one of her faults she has no faults says he doggedly and then well she knows i am to be here this afternoon yes i told her i am glad of that if she returns with you from the barbizons with a quick but heavy sigh there will be no hope in that don't be too hard says mrs monkton who in truth is feeling a little frightened to come back without joyce and encounter a irate young man with freddy goodness knows where she may have other engagements she says she waves him an airy adieu as she makes this cruel suggestion and with a kiss more hurried than usual to the children and a good deal of nervousness in her whole manner runs down the steps to her hansom and disappears felix thus abandoned yields himself to the enemy he gives his right hand to freddy and his left to mabel and lets them lead him captive into the dining-room i expect dinner is cold says tommy cheerfully seating himself with more ado and watching the nurse who is always in attendance at this meal as she raises the cover from the boiled leg of mutton oh no not yet said mr dysart quite as cheerfully raising the carving knife and fork something however ominous in the silence that has fallen on both children make itself felt and without being able exactly to realize it he suspends operation for a moment to look at them he finds four eyes staring in his direction with astonishment 
generously mingled with pious horror shining in their clear depths eh says he involuntarily aren't you going to say it asked mabel in a severe tone say what says he grace returns tommy with a distinct disprobation oh er yes of course how could i have forgotten it says dysart spasmodically laying down the carvers at once and preparing to distinguish himself he succeeds admirably the children are leaning on the tablecloth in devout expectation that has something however sinister about it nurse is looking on also expectant mr dysart makes a wild struggle with his memory but all to no effect the beginning of various prayers come with malignant readiness to his mind the ends of several psalms the middles of a verse or two but the graces shamelessly desert him in his hour of need good gracious what is the usual one the one they use at home the er he becomes miserably conscious that tommy's left eye is cocked sideways and is regarding him with fatal understanding in a state of desperation he bends forward as low as he well can wondering vaguely where on earth is his hat and mumbles something into his plate that might be a bit of a prayer but certainly is not a grace perhaps it is a last cry for help what's that demands tommy promptly i didn't hear one word of it says mabel with indignation mr dysart is too stricken to be able to frame a reply i don't believe you know one continues tommy still fixing him with an uncompromising eye i don't believe you were saying anything do you nurse oh fie now master tommy i heard your ma telling you you were to be good well so i am good tis he isn't good he won't say his prayers do you know one turning again to dysart who is covered with confusion what the deuce did he say here for why didn't he go to his club he could have been back in plenty of time if that confounded grinning woman of a nurse would only go away it wouldn't be so bad but never mind says mabel with calm resignation i'll say one for you no you shan't cries tommy it's my turn no it isn't it is mabel you said it yesterday and you know you said relieve instead of received and mother laughed and i don't care it is mr dysart's turn to-day and he'll give his to me won't you mr dysart you're a greedy thing cries tommy wrathfully and you shan't say it i'll tell mr dysart what you did this morning if you do i don't care with disgraceful callousness i will say it then i'll say it too says tommy with sudden inspiration born of a determination to die rather than give in and instantly four fat hands are joined in pairs and two sapphiric countenances are appraised and two shrill voices at screaming pitch are giving thanks for the boiled mutton at a racing speed that censorious people might probably connect with a desire on the part of each to be first in at the finish manfully they fight it out to the bitter end without a break or a comma and with defiant eyes glaring at each other across the table there is a good deal of the grace it is quite a long one when usually said and yet very little grace in it to-day when all is told you may go now nurse says mabel presently when the mutton has been removed and nurse has placed the rice and jam on the table mr dysart will attend to us it is impossible to describe the grown-up air with which this command is given it is so like mrs monkton's own voice and manner that felix with a start turns his eyes on the author of it and nurse with an ill-suppressed smile leaves the room 
that's what mammy always says when there's only her and me and tommy explains mabel confidently then you with a doubtful glance you will attend to us won't you i'll do my best says felix in a depressed tone whose spirits are growing low after all there was safety in nurse i think i'll come up and sit nearer to you says tommy affably he gets down from his chair and pushes it creaking hideously up to mr dysart's elbow right under it in fact so will i says mabel fired with joy at the prospect of getting away from her proper place and eating her rice in a forbidden spot but begins felix vaguely do you think your mother would we always do it when we are alone with mommy says tommy she says it keeps us warm to get under her wing when the weather is cold says mabel lifting a lovely little face to his and bringing her chair down on the top of his toe she says it keeps her warm too are you warm now anxiously yes yes burning says mr dysart whose toe is not unconscious of a corn ah i knew you'd like it says tommy now go on give us our rice a little rice and a lot of jam is that what your mother does too asks mr dysart meanly it must be confessed but his toe is very bad still the silence that follows his question and the look of the two downcast little faces is however punishment enough well so be it says he but even if we do finish the jam i'm awfully fond of it myself we must promise faithfully not to be disagreeable about it not to be ill that is ill we're never ill says tommy valiantly whereupon they make an end of the jam in no time end of chapter thirty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirty eight of april's lady this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter number 38. Tis said the rose is love's own flower its blush so bright its thorns so many there is no mistake in the joy with which felix parts from his companions after luncheon he breathes afresh as he sees them tearing up the staircase to get ready for their afternoon walk nurse puffing and panting behind them the drawing-room seems a bower of repose after the turmoil of the late feast and besides it cannot be long now before she they return that is if they she return at all he has indeed ample time given him to imagine this last horrible possibility as not only a probability but a certainty before the sound of coming footsteps up the stairs and the fro fro of pretty frocks tells him his doubts were harmless involuntarily he rises from his chair and straightens himself out of the rather forlorn position into which he has fallen and fixes his eyes immovably upon the door are there two of them that is beyond doubt it is only mad people who chatter to themselves and certainly mrs monkton is not mad barbara has indeed raised her voice a little more than ordinary and has addressed joyce by her name on her hurried way up the staircase and across the cushioned recess outside the door now she throws open the door and enters radiant if a little nervous here we are 
says she very pleasantly and with all the put-on manner of one who has made up her mind to be extremely joyous under distinct difficulties you are still here then and alone they didn't murder you joyce and i had our misgivings all along ah i forgot you haven't seen joyce until now how do you do says miss kavanagh holding out her hand to him with a calm as perfect as her smile i do hope they were good goes on mrs monkton her nervousness rather increasing you know i have always said they were the best children in the world ah said said repeats mrs monkton who now seems grateful for the chance of saying anything what is the meaning of joyce's sudden amiability and is it amiability or it is true one can say almost anything says joyce quite pleasantly she nods her head prettily at dysart there is no law to prevent them barbara thinks you are not sincere she is not fair to you you always do mean what you say don't you but for the smile that accompanies these words dysart would have felt his doom sealed but could she mean a stab so cruel so direct and still look kind oh he is always sincere says barbara quickly only people say things about one's children you know that she stops they are the dearest children you are a bad mother you wrong them says joyce laughing lightly plainly at the idea of barbara's affection for her children being impugned she told me turning her lovely eyes full on dysart with no special expression in them whatsoever that i should find only your remains after spending an hour with them her smile was brilliant she was wrong you see i am still here says felix hardly knowing what he says in his desire to read her face which is strictly impassive yes still here says miss kavanagh smiling always and apparently meaning nothing at all yet to felix watching her there seems to be something treacherous in her manner still here had she hoped he would be gone was that the cause of her delay had she purposely put off coming home to give him time to grow tired and go away and yet she is looking at him with a smile i'm afraid you had a bad luncheon and a bad time generally says mrs monkton quickly who seemed hurried in every way but we came home as soon as ever we could didn't we joyce her appeal to her sister is suggestive of fear as to the answer but she need not have been nervous about that we flew declares miss kavanagh with delightful zeal we thought we should never get here soon enough didn't we barbara there is the very barest faintest imitation of her sister's voice in this last question a subtle touch of mockery so slight so evanescent as to leave one doubtful as to its ever having existed yes yes indeed says barbara coloring we flew so fast indeed that i am sure you are thoroughly fatigued says miss kavanagh addressing her why don't you run away now and take off your bonnet and lay down for an hour or so but begins barbara and then stops short what does it all mean this new departure of her sister's puzzles her to so deliberately ask for a tete-a-tete -tete with felix to what end the girl's manner so bright filled with such a glittering geniality so unlike the usual listlessness that has characterized it for so long both confuses and alarms her why is she so amiable now there has been a little difficulty about getting her back 
at all quite enough to make mrs monkton shiver for dysart's reception by her and here now half an hour later she is beaming upon him and being more than ordinarily civil what is she going to do oh no buts said joyce gaily you know you said your head was aching and mr dysart will excuse you he will not be so badly off even without you he will have me she turns a full glance on felix as she says this and looks at him with lustrous eyes and white teeth showing through her parted lips the soupon of mockery in her whole air of which all through he has been faintly but uncomfortably aware has deepened i shall take care he is not dull but says barbara again rather helplessly no no you must rest yourself remember we are going to that at home at the thysers to-night and i would not miss it for anything don't dwell with such sad looks on mr dysart i have promised to look after him you will let me take care of you for a little while mr dysart will you not turning another brilliant smile upon felix who responds to it very gravely he is regarding her with a searching air how is it with her some old words reoccur to him there is treachery o oh, azea why does she look at him like that he must trust her present attitude even that aggressive mood of hers at the dore gallery on the last day when they met was preferable to this agreeable but detestable indifference it is always a pleasure to be with you says he steadily perhaps a little doggily there see you says joyce with a pretty little nod at her sister well i shall take half an hour's rest says mrs monkton reluctantly who is in truth feeling as fresh as a daisy but who is afraid to stay but i shall be back for tea she gives a little kindly glance to felix and with a heart filled with forebodings leaves the room what a glorious day it has been says joyce continuing the conversation with dysart in that new manner of hers quite as if barbara's going was a matter of small importance and the fact that she has left him for the first time for all these months alone together of less importance still she is standing on the hearth rug and is slowly taking the pins out of her bonnet she seems utterly unconcerned he might be the veriest stranger or else the oldest the most uninteresting friend in the world she has taken out all the pins now and has thrown her bonnet on to the lounge nearest to her and is standing before the glass in the over mantel patting and pushing into order the soft locks that lie upon her forehead End of chapter 38 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 39 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter thirty nine ah were she pitiful as she is fair life's a varied bright illusion joy and sorrow light and shade it was almost warm says she turning round to him she seems to be talking all the time so vivid is her face so intense her vitality i was so glad to see the barbizons again you know them don't you kit looked perfect so lovely so good in every way 
voice face manners i felt i envied her it would be delightful to feel that every one must be admiring one as she does she glances at him and he leans a little toward her no no not a compliment please i know i am as much behind kit as the moon is behind the sun i wasn't going to pay you a compliment says he slowly no she laughs it was unlike her to have made that remark and just as unlike her to have taken his rather discourteous reply so good-naturedly it was a charming visit she goes on not in haste but idly as it were as if words are easy to her i quite enjoyed it barbara didn't i think she wanted to get home she is always thinking of the babies or well i did i am not ungrateful i take the goods the gods provide and find honest pleasure in them i do not think indeed i laugh so much for quite a century as to-day with kit she is sympathetic says felix with the smallest thought of the person in question in his mind more than that surely though that is a hymn of praise in itself after all it is a relief to meet irish people when one has spent a week or two in solid england you agree with me i am english returns he oh of course how rude of me i didn't mean it however i had entirely forgotten our acquaintance has been confined entirely to irish soul until this luckless moment you do forgive me she is leaning a little forward and looking at him with a careless expression no returns he briefly well you should says she taking no notice of his cold rejoinder and treating it indeed as if it is of no moment there was a deeper meaning in his refusal to grant her absolution she declines to acknowledge it still even that batiste of mine need not prevent you from seeing some truth in my argument we have our charms we irish eh your charm well mine if you like as a type and recklessly and with a shrug of her shoulders if you wish to be personal she had gone a little too far i think i have acknowledged that says he coldly he rises abruptly and goes over to where she is standing on the hearth-rug shading her face from the fire with a huge japanese fan have i ever denied your charm his tone has been growing in intensity and now becomes stern why do you talk to me like this what is the meaning of it all your altered manner everything why did you grant me this interview perhaps because still with that radiant smile bright and cold as early frost like that little soapy boy i thought you would not be happy till you got it she laughs lightly the laugh is the outcome of the smile and is close imitation it is perfectly successful but on the surface only there is no heart in it you think i arranged it oh no how could i you have just said i arranged it she shuts up her fan with a little click you want to say something don't you she says well say it you give me permission then asks he gravely despair knocking at his heart why not would i have you unhappy always her tone is jesting throughout you think taking the hand that holds the fan and restraining its motion for a moment that if i do speak i shall be happier ah that is beyond me says she and yet yes to get a thing over is to get rid of fatigue i have argued it all out for myself and have come to the conclusion for yourself well for you too 
a little impatiently. After all, it is you who want to speak. Silence to me is golden, but it occurred to me in the silent watches of the night, with another, now rather forced, little laugh, that if you once said to me all you had to say, you would be contented, and go away, and not trouble me any more. I can do that now, without saying anything, says he slowly. He has dropped her hand. He is evidently deeply wounded. Can you? Her eyes are resting restlessly on his. Is there magic in them? Her mouth has taken a strange expression. I might have known how it would be, says Dysart, throwing up his head. You will not forgive. It was but a moment, a few words, idle, hardly considered, and— Oh, yes, considered, says she slowly. They were unmeant, persists he fiercely. I defy you to think otherwise. One great mistake, a second's madness, and you have ordained that it shall wreck my whole life. You, that evening in the library at the court, I had not thought of. Ah, she interrupts him even more by her gesture which betrays the first touch of passion she has shown, than by her voice that is still mocking. I knew you would have to say it. You know me, indeed, says he, with an enforced calmness that leaves him very white. My whole heart and soul lies bare to you, to ruin it as you will. It is the merest waste of time, I know, but still I have felt all along that I must tell you again that I love you, though I fully understand I shall receive nothing in return but scorn and contempt. Still, to be able even to say it is a relief to me. And what is it to me? asks the girl, as pale now as he is. Is it a relief? A comfort to me to have to listen to you she clenches her hands involuntarily the fan falls with a little crash to the ground no he is silent a moment no it is unfair unjust you shall not be made uncomfortable again it is the last time I shall not trouble you again in this way I don't say we shall never meet again you, pausing and looking at her, you do not desire that. Oh, no, coldly, politely. If you do, say so at once, with a rather peremptory ring in his tone. I should, calmly. I am glad of that, as my cousin is a great friend of mine, and as I shall get a fortnight's leave soon, I shall probably run over to Ireland and spend it with her. After all, bitterly, why should I suppose it would be disagreeable to you? It was quite a natural idea, says she immovably. However, says he steadily, you need not be afraid that, even if we do meet, I shall ever annoy you in this way again. Oh, I am never afraid, says she, with that terrible smile that seems to f freeze him. Well, good-bye. Holding out his hand, he is quite as composed as she is now, and is even able to return her smile in kind. So soon? But Barbara will be down in to tea in a few minutes. You will surely wait for her? I think not. But really do. I am going to see after the children and give them some chocolate I brought for them. It will probably make them ill, says he, smiling still. No, thank you. I must go now, indeed. You will make my excuses to Mrs. Monkton, please. Good-bye. Good-bye, says she, laying her hand in his for a second. She has grown suddenly very cold, shivering. It seems almost as if an icy blast from some open portal 
has been blown in upon her he is still looking at her there is something wild strange in his expression you cannot realize it but i can says he unsteadily it is good-bye forever so far as life for me is concerned he has turned away from her he is gone the sharp closing of the door wakens her to the fact that she is alone mechanically quite calmly she looks around the empty room there is a little persian chair cover over there all awry she rearranges it with a critical eye to its proper appearance and afterward pushes a small chair into its place she pats a cushion or two and finally taking up her bonnet and the pins she had laid upon the chimney piece goes up to her own room once there with a rush the whole thing comes back to her the entire meaning of it what she has done that word forever the bonnet has fallen from her fingers sinking upon her knees beside the bed she buries her face out of sight presently her slender frame is torn by those cruel yet merciful sob end of chapter thirty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter forty the sense of death is most in apprehension thus grief still treads upon the heels of pleasure it is destined to be a day of grief monkton who had been out all the morning having gone to see the old people a usual habit of his had not returned to dinner a very unusual habit with him it had occurred however once or twice that he had stayed to dine with them on such occasions as when sir george had had a troublesome letter from his elder son and had looked to the younger to give him some comfort some of his time to help him to bear it by talking it all over barbara therefore while dressing for mrs theaker's at home had scarcely felt anxiety and indeed it is only now when she has come down to the drawing-room to find joyce awaiting her also in gala garb so far as a gown goes that a suspicion of coming trouble takes possession of her he is late isn't he she says looking at joyce with something nervous in her expression what can have kept him i know he wanted to meet the general and now what can it be his mother probably said joyce indifferently from your description of her i should say she must be a most thoroughly uncomfortable old person yes not pleasant certainly a little of her as george ingram used to say goes a long way but still and these these people are friends of his and you are working yourself up into a thorough belief in the sensational street accident says joyce who has seated herself well out of the glare of the chandelier you want to be tragic it is a mistake believe me something in the bitterness of the girl's tone strikes on her sister's ear joyce had not come down to dinner had pleaded a headache as an excuse for her non-appearance and mrs monkton and tommy she could not bear to dine alone had devoured a meal a deux. tommy had certainly been anything but dull company has anything happened joyce asked her sister quickly she has had her suspicions of course but they were of the vaguest order joyce laughs i told you your nerves were out of order says she 
what should happen are you still dwelling on the running over business i assure you you wrong freddy he can take care of himself at a crossing as well as another man and better even a handsome i am convinced could do no harm to freddy i wasn't thinking of him said barbara a little reproachfully perhaps i no then you ought to be ashamed of yourself here he is cries she suddenly springing to her feet as a sound of monkton's footsteps ascending the stairs can now be distinctly heard i hope you will explain yourself to him she laughs again and disappears through the doorway that leads to the second hall outside as monkton enters how late you are freddy says his wife the reproach in her voice heightened because of the anxiety she has been enduring i thought you would never what is it what has happened freddy there is bad news yes very bad says monkton sinking into a chair your brother breathlessly of late she has always known that trouble is to be expected from him he is dead said monkton in a low tone barbara flinging her opera cloak aside comes quickly to him she leans over him and slips her arms round his neck dead says she in an awestruck tone yes killed himself shot himself the telegram came this morning when i was with them i could not come home sooner it was impossible to leave them oh freddy i am so sorry you left them even now a line to me would have done oh what a horrible thing and to die like that yes he presses one of her hands and then rising begins to move hurriedly up and down the room it was a misfortune upon misfortune he says presently when i was over there this morning they had just received a letter filled with from him yes that is what seemed to make it so much worse later on life in the morning death in the afternoon his voice grows choked and such a letter as it was filled with nothing but a most scandalous account of his oh he breaks off suddenly as if shocked oh he is dead poor fellow don't take it like that says barbara following him and clinging to him you know you could not be unkind there were debts then debts it is difficult to explain just now my head is aching so and those poor old people well it means ruin for them barbara of course his debts must be paid his honor kept intact for the sake of the old name but they will let all the houses the two in town this one and their own and and the old place down in warwickshire the home all must go out of their hands oh freddy surely surely there must be some way not one i spoke about breaking the entail you know i his death poor fellow i yes yes dear but they won't hear of it my mother was very angry even in her grief when i proposed it they hope that by strict retrenchment the property will be itself again and they spoke about tommy they said it would be unjust to him and to you quickly she would not have him ignored any longer oh as for me i am not a boy you know tommy is safe to inherit as life goes well so are you said she with a sharp pang at her heart yes of course i am only making out a case i think it was kind of them to remember tommy's claim in the midst of their own grief it was indeed says she remorsefully oh it was but if they give up everything where will they go they talk of taking a cottage a small house somewhere they want to give up everything to pay his infamous there sharply i am forgetting again but to see them makes one forget everything else 
he begins to walk up and down the room again as if inaction is impossible to him my mother who has been accustomed to a certain luxury all her life to be now at the very close of it condemned to it would break your heart to see her and she will let nothing be said of him oh no still there should be justice i can't help feeling that her blameless life and his and she is the one to suffer it is often so says his wife in a low tone it is an old story dearest but i know that when the old stories come home to us individually they always sound so terribly new but what do they mean by a small house asked she presently in a distressed tone well i suppose a small house said he with just a passing gleam of his old jesting manner you know my mother cannot bear the country so i think the cottage idea will fall through freddy says his wife suddenly she can't go into a small house a london small house it is out of the question could they not come and live with us she is suggesting a martyrdom for herself yet she does it unflinchingly what my aunt and all asks he regarding her earnestly oh of course of course poor old thing says she unable this time however to hide the quaver that desolates her voice no says her husband with suspicion of vehemence he takes her suddenly in his arms and kisses her because two or three people are unhappy is no reason why a fourth should be made so and i don't want your life spoiled so far as i can prevent it i suppose you have guessed that i must go over to nice where he is my father could not possibly go alone in his present state when must you go to-morrow as for you if we could go home says she uncertainly that is what i would suggest but how will you manage without me the children are so troublesome when taken out of their usual beat and their nurse i often wonder which would require the most looking after they or she it occurred to me to ask dysart to see you across he is so kind such a friend says mrs monkton but she might have said more but at this instant joyce appeared in the doorway we shall be late cries she and freddy not even dressed why oh has anything really happened yes yes said barbara hurriedly a few words explains all we must go home to-morrow you see and freddy thinks that felix would look after us until we reach kensington or north wall felix mr dysart the girl's face had grown pale during the recital of the suicide but now it looks ghastly why should he come cries she in a ringing tone that has actual fear in it do you suppose that we two cannot manage the children between us oh nonsense barbara why tommy is as sensible as he can be and if nurse does prove incapable and a prey to seasickness well i can take baby and you can look after mabel it will be all right we are not going to america really freddy please say you will not trouble mr dysart about this matter yes i really think we shall not require him says barbara something in the glittering brightness of her sister's eye warns her to give in at once and indeed she has been unconsciously a little half-hearted about having felix or any stranger as a travelling companion there run away joyce and go to your bed darling you look very tired i must still arrange some few things with freddy what is the matter with her asks monkton when joyce has gone away she looks as if she had been crying and her matter is so excitable she has been strange all day almost repellent felix called and i don't know what happened she insisted upon my leaving her alone with him 
but I am afraid there was a scene of some sort. I know she had been crying, because her eyes were so red, but she would say nothing, and I was afraid to ask her. Better not. I hope she is not still thinking of that fellow, Beau Clark. However, he stops short and sighs heavily. You must not think of her now, says Barbara quickly. Your own trouble is enough for you. Were your brother's affairs so very bad that they necessitate the giving up of everything? It has been going on for years. My father has had to economize, to cut down everything. You know the old place was let to a Mr. Mr. I quite forget the name now, pressing his hand to his brow, a Manchester man at all events, but we always hoped my father would have been able to take it back from him next year, but now, but you say they think in time that the property will, they think so, I don't, but it would be a pity to undeceive them. I am afraid, Barbara, with a sad look at her, you made a bad match, even when the chance comes your way to rise out of poverty it proves a thoroughly useless one. It isn't like you to talk like that," says she quickly. There you are, overwrought, and no wonder, too. Come upstairs and let us see what you will want for your journey. Her tone had grown purposely brisk. Surely on occasion such as this she is a wife, a companion in a thousand. There must be many things to be considered, both for you and for me, and the thing is to take nothing unnecessary. Those foreign places I hear are so it hardly matters what I take, says he wearily. Well, it matters what I take, says she briskly. Come and give me help, Freddy. You know how I hate to have servants standing over me. Other people stand over their servants, but they are poor rich people. I like to see how the clothes are packed. She is speaking not quite truthfully. Few people like to be spared trouble so much as she does, but it seems good in her eyes now to rouse him from the melancholy that is fast growing on him. Come, she says, tucking her arm into his. End of chapter 40 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 41 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 41. It is not tomorrow. Ah, were it to-day, there are two that I know that would be gay. Good-bye, good-bye, good-bye. Ah, I parting wounds so bitterly. It is six weeks later. Spring has come up this way, and all the earth is glad with a fresh birth. Tantara, the joyous book of spring, lies open, writ in blossoms, not a bird of evil augury is seen or heard come now like pan's old crew will dance and sing or oberon's for hill and valley ring to march's bugle horn earth's blood is stirred march has indeed come boisterous wild terrible in many ways but lovely in others there is a freshness in the air that rouses glad thoughts within the breast, vague thoughts, sweet as, as undefinable, and that yet mean life. The whole land seems to have sprung up from a long slumber, and to be looking with wide happy eyes upon the fresh marvels nature is preparing for it. Rather naked she stands as yet, rubbing her sleepy lids having just cast from her her coat of snow, 
and feeling somewhat bare in the frail garment of bursting leaves and timid grass growths that as yet is all she can find wherein to hide her charms but half clothed as she is she is still beautiful everything seems full of eager triumph hills trees valleys lawns and bursting streams all are overflowing with wild enjoyment all the dull dingy drapery in which winter had shrouded them has now been cast aside and the resplendent furniture with which each spring delights to deck her home stands revealed all these past dead months her house has lain desolate enfolded in death's cements but now uprising in her vigorous youth she flings aside the dull coverings and lets the sweet brilliant hues that lie beneath shine forth in all their beauty to meet the eye of day earth and sky are in bridal array and from the rich recesses of the woods and from each shrub and branch the soft glad paeans of the mating birds sound like a wedding chant monkton had come back from the sad journey to nice some weeks ago he had had very little to tell on his return and that of the saddest it had all been only too true about those inquisitous debts and the old people were in great distress the two townhouses should be let at once and the old place in warwickshire the home as he called it well there was no hope now that it would ever be redeemed from the hands of the manchester people who held it and sir george had been so sure that this spring he would have been in a position to get back his own and have the old place once more in his possession it was all very sad there is no hope now he will have to let the place to barton for the next ten years said monkton to his wife when he got home barton was the manchester man he is still holding off about doing it but he knows it must be done and at all events the reality won't be a bit worse than the thinking about it poor old governor you wouldn't know him barbara he has gone to skin and bone and such a frightened sort of look in his eyes oh poor poor old man cried barbara who could forget everything in the way of past unkindness where her sympathies were enlisted toward the end of february the guests had begun to arrive at the court lady baltimore had returned there during january with her little son but baltimore had not put in an appearance for some weeks a good many new people unknown to the monktons had arrived there with others whom they did know and after a while dicky brown had come and miss maliphant and the brabazons and some others whom joyce was on friendly terms but even though lady baltimore had made rather a point of the girls being with her joyce had gone to her but sparingly and always in fear and trembling it was so impossible to know who might not have arrived last night or was going to arrive this night besides barbara and freddy were so saddened so upset by the lake death and its consequences that it seemed unkind even to pretend to enjoy oneself joyce grasped at the excuse to say no very often to lady baltimore's kindly longings to have her with her that up to this neither dysart nor beauclerk had come to the court had been a comfort to her but that they might come at any moment kept her watchful and uneasy indeed only yesterday she had heard from lady baltimore that both were expected during the ensuing week that news leaves her rather unstrung and nervous to-day after luncheon having successfully eluded tommy the lynx-eyed she decided upon going for a long walk with a view to working off the depression to which she had become prey 
this is how she happens to be out of the way when the letter comes for barbara that changes altogether the tenor of their lives the afternoon post brings it the delicious spring day has worn itself almost to a close when monkton entering his wife's room where she is busy at a sewing machine altering a frock for mabel drops a letter over her shoulder into her lap what a queer-looking letter says she staring in amazement at the big official blue envelope aha i thought it would make you shiver says he lounging over to the fire and nestling his back comfortably against the mantelpiece what have you been up to i should like to know no wonder you are turning a lively purple but what can it be says she that just it says he teasingly i hope they aren't going to arrest you that's all five years penal servitude is not a thing to hanker after mrs monkton however is not listening to this tirade she has broken open the envelope and is now scanning hurriedly the contents of this important looking document within there is a pause a lengthened one presently barbara rises from her seat mechanically as if it were always with her eyes fixed on the letter in her hand she has grown a little pale a little puzzled frown is contracting her forehead freddy says she in a rather strange tone what says he quickly no more bad news i hope oh no oh yes i can't quite make it out but i'm afraid my poor uncle is dead your uncle yes yes my father's brother i think i told you about him he went abroad years ago and we joyce and i believed him dead a long time ago long before i married you even but now come here and read it it is worded so oddly that it puzzles me let me see it says monkton he sinks into an easy chair and drags her down on to his knee the better to see over her shoulder this satisfactory arranged he begins to read rapidly the letter she holds up before his eyes yes dead indeed says he sotto voice go on turn over you mustn't fret about that you know barbara er er reading what's this by jove what says his an wife anxiously what is the meaning of this horrid letter freddy there are a few people who might not call it horrid says monkton placing his arm round her and rising from the chair he is looking very grave even though it brings you news of your poor uncle's death still it brings you to the information that you are heiress to about a quarter of a million what says barbara faintly and then oh no oh nonsense there must be some mistake well it sounds like it at all events sad occurrence hm hm reading co hyrus very considerable fortune he looks to the signature of the letter hodgkin and fair very respectable firm my father has had dealings with them they say your uncle died in sydney and has left behind him an immense sum of money half a million in fact to which you and joyce are co heiresses there must be a mistake repeats barbara in a low tone it seems too like a fairy tale it does and yet lawyers like hodgkin and fair are not likely to be led into a cul-de-sac if he pauses and looks earnestly at his wife if it does prove true barbara you will be a very rich woman and you will be rich with me she says quickly in an agitated tone but but yes it does seem difficult to believe interrupts he slowly what a letter his eyes fall on it again and she drawing close to him reads it once more carefully i think there is truth in it says she at last it sounds more like being all right 
more reasonable when read a second time freddy she steps a little bit away from him and rests her beautiful eyes full on his have you thought says she slowly that if there is truth in this story how much we shall be able to do for your father and mother monkton starts as if stung for them to do anything for them for the two who had so wantonly offended and insulted her during all their married life is her first thought to be for them yes yes says she eagerly we shall be able to help them out of all their difficulties oh i didn't say much to you but in their grief their troubles have gone to my very heart i couldn't bear to think of their being obliged to give up their hoses their comforts and in their old age too now we shall be able to smooth matters for them end of chapter forty one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty two of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter forty two it's we two it's we two it's we two for a all the world and we two and heaven be our stay like a lava rock in the lift sing o bonny bride all the world was adam once with eve by his side the light in her eyes is angelic she has laid her hands upon both her husband's arms as if expecting him to take her into them as he always does only too gladly on the smallest provocation just now however he fails her for the moment only however barbara says he in a choked voice he holds her from him examining her face critically his thoughts are painful yet proud proud beyond telling his examination does not last long there is nothing but good to be read in that fair sweet lovable face he gathers her to him with a force that is almost hurtful are you a woman at all or just an angel says he with a deep sigh what is it freddy after all they have done to you their insults coldness abominable conduct to think that your first thought should be for them why look here barbara vehemently they are not worthy that you should tut interrupts she lightly yet with a little sob in her throat his praise is so sweet to her you overrate me is it for them i would do it or for you there take all the thought for yourself and besides are not you and i one and shall not your people be my people come if you think of it there is no such great merit after all you forget no not a word against them i won't listen thrusting her fingers into her ears it is all over and done with long ago and it is our turn now and let us do things decently and in order and create no heart-burnings but when i think if thinking makes you look like that don't think but i must i must remember how they scorned and slighted you it never seems to have come home to me so vividly as now now when you seem to have forgotten it oh barbara he presses back her head and looks long and tenderly into her eyes i was not mistaken indeed when i gave you my heart surely you are one among ten thousand silly boy says she with a little tremendous laugh glad to her very soul center however because of his words what is there to praise me for have i not warned you that i am purely selfish 
what is there i would not do for very love of you come freddy shaking herself loose from him and laughing now with honest delight let us be reasonable oh poor uncle it seems hateful to rejoice thus over his death but his memory is really only a shadow after all and i suppose he meant to make us happy by his gift eh freddy yes how well he remembered during all these years he could have formed no other ties none naturally short pause there is that black mare of mike donovan's freddy that you so fancied you can buy it now monkton laughs involuntarily something of the child has always lingered about barbara and i should like to get a black velvet gown says she her face brightening and to buy joyce a oh but joyce will be rich herself yes i'm really afraid you will be done out of the joy of overloading joyce with gifts she'll be able to give you something that will be a change at all events as for the velvet gown if this touching the letter bears any meaning i should think you need not confine yourself to one velvet gown and there's tommy says she quickly her thoughts running so fast that she scarcely hears them you have always said you wanted to put him in the army now you can do it yes says monkton with sudden interest i should like that but you you shrank from the thought didn't you well he might have to go to india says she nervously and what of that oh nothing that is nothing really only there are lions and tigers there freddy aren't there now one or two says mr monkton if we are to believe travellers tales but they are all proverbially false i don't believe in lions at all myself i'm sure they are miss well let him go into the navy then lions and tigers don't as a rule inhabit the great deep oh no but sharks do says she with a visible shudder no no on the whole i had rather trust him to the beasts of the field he could run away from them but you can't run in the sea true says mr monkton with exemplary gravity i couldn't at all events monkton had to run across to london about the extraordinary legacy left to his wife and joyce but further investigation proved the story true the money was indeed there and they were the only heirs from being distinctly poor they rose to the height of a very respectable income and monkton being in town where the old monktons still were also was commanded by his wife to go to them and pay off their largest liabilities debt contracted by their dead son and to so arrange that they should not be at the necessity of leaving themselves houseless the manchester people who had taken the old place in warwickshire were now informed that they could not have it beyond the term agreed on but about this the, the old people had something to say too they would not take back the family place they had but one son now and the sooner he went to live there the better lady monkton completely broken down and melted by barbara's generosity went so far as to send her a long letter telling her it would be the dearest wish of her and sir george's hearts that she should preside as mistress over the beautiful old homestead and that it would give them great happiness to imagine the children the grandchildren running riot through the big wainscoted rooms barbara was not to wait for her lady monkton's death to take up her position as head of the house she was to go to warwickshire at once the moment those detestable manchester people were out of it and lady monkton if barbara would be so good as to make her welcome would like to come to her for three months every year to see the children and her son and her daughter 
The last was the crowning touch. For the rest, Barbara was not to hesitate about accepting the Warwickshire place, as Lady Monkton and Sir George were devoted to town life, and never felt quite well when away from smoky London. This last was true. As a fact, the old people were thoroughly imbued with the desire for the turmoil of city life, and the three months of country Lady Monkton had stipulated for were quite as much as they desired of rustic felicity. Barbara accepted the gift of the old home. Eventually, of course, it would be hers, but she knew the old people meant the present of giving it a sort of return for her liberality, for the generosity that had enabled them to once more lift their heads among their equals. The great news had spread like wildfire through the Irish country where the Frederick Monktons lived. Lady Baltimore was unfeigningly glad about it, and came down at once to embrace Barbara and say all sorts of delightful things about it. The excitement of the whole affair seemed to dissipate all the sadness and depression that had followed on the death of the elder son, and nothing now was talked of but the great good luck that had fallen into the paths of Barbara and Joyce. The poor old uncle had been considered dead for so many years previously, and was indeed such a dim memory to his nieces that it would have been the purest affection to pretend to feel any deep grief for his demise. Perhaps what grieved Barbara most of all, though she said very little about it, was the idea of having to leave the old house in which they were now living. It did not cheer her to think of the place in Warwickshire, which, of course, was beautiful and full of possibilities. This foolish old Irish home, rich in discomforts, was home. It seemed hard to abandon it. It was not a palatial mansion, certainly. It was even dismal in many ways, but it contained more love in its little space than many a noble mansion could boast. It seemed cruel, ungrateful, to cast it behind her, once it was possible to mount a few steps on the rungs of the worldly ladder. How happy they had all been here together, in the foolish old house, that every severe storm seemed to threaten with final dissolution. It gave her many a secret pang to think that she must part from it for ever before another year should dawn. End of chapter 42 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 43 of April Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 43 Looks the heart alone discover, if the tongue its thoughts can tell, tis in vain you play the lover, you have never felt the spell. Joyce, who had been dreading, with a silent but terrible fear, her first meeting with Dysart, had found it no such great matter after all, when they were at last face to face. Dysart had met her as coolly, with apparently as little concern as though no formal passages had ever taken place between them. His manner was perfectly calm, and as devoid of feeling as any one could desire, and it was open to her comprehension that he avoided her whenever he possibly could. She told herself this was all she could, or did, desire, yet nevertheless she writhed beneath the certainty of it. Beauclerk had not arrived until a week later than Dysart, 
until, indeed, the news of the marvellous fortune that had come to her was well authenticated, and then had been all that could possibly be expected of him. His manner was perfect. He sat still and gazed with delightfully friendly eyes into Miss Maliphant's pleased countenance, and anon skipped across room or lawn to whisper beautiful nothings to Miss Cavanagh. The latter's change of fortune did not, apparently, seem to affect him in the least. After all, even now she was not as good a parte as Miss Maliphant, where Bunny was concerned, but then there were other things. Whatever his outward manner might lead one to suspect, beyond doubt he thought a great deal at this time, and finally came to a conclusion. Joyce's fortune had helped her in many ways. It had helped many of the poor around her, too, but it did even more than that. It helped Mr. Beauclerk to make up his mind with regard to his matrimonial prospects. Sitting in his chambers in town with Lady Baltimore's letter before him that told him of the change in Joyce's fortune, of the fortune that had changed her, in fact, from a pretty penniless girl to a pretty rich one, he told himself that, after all, she has certainly been the girl for him since the commencement of their acquaintance. She was charming, not a whit more now than then. He would not believe his own taste so far as to admit that she was more desirable in any way now in her prosperity than when first he saw her and paid her the immense compliment of admiring her. He permitted himself to grow a little enthusiastic, however, to say out loud to himself, as it were, all that he had hardly allowed himself to think up to this. She was, beyond question, the most charming girl in the world. Such grace, such finish, a girl worthy of the love of the best of men, presumably himself. He had always loved her, always. He had never felt so sure of the, that delightful fact now. He had had a kind of knowledge, even when afraid to give ear to it, that she was the wife best suited to him to be found anywhere. She understood him. They were thoroughly en rapport with each other. Their marriage would be a success in the deepest, sincerest meaning of the word. He leant luxuriously among the cushions of his chair, lit a fragrant cigarette, and ran his mind backward over many things. Well, perhaps so, but yet if he had refrained from proposing to her until now, now when fate smiles upon her, it was simply because he dreaded dragging her into a marriage where she could not have all those little best things of life that so peerless a creature had every right to demand. Yes, it was for her sake alone he had hesitated. He feels sure of that now. He has thoroughly persuaded himself the purity of the motives that kept him tongue-tied when honor called aloud to him for speech. He feels himself so exalted that he metaphorically pats himself upon the back and tells himself he is a righteous being, a very brutus where honor is concerned. Any other man might have hurried that exquisite creature into a squalid marriage for the mere sake of gratifying an overpowering affection, but he had been above all that. He had considered her. The man's duty is ever to protect the woman. He had protected her, even from herself, for that she would have been only too willing to link her sweet fate with his at any price, was patent to all the world. Few people have felt as virtuous as Mr. Beauclerk as he comes to the end of this thread of his imaginings. Well, he will make it up to her. 
he smiles benignly through the smoke that rises round his nose she shall never have reason to remember that he had not fallen on his knees to her as a less considerate man might have done when he was without the means to make her life as bright as it should be the most eager of lovers must live and eating is the first move towards that conclusion yet if he had given way to selfish desires they would scarcely he and she have had sufficient bread of any delectable kind to fill their mouths but now all would be different she clever girl had supplied the blank she had squared the difficulty having provided the wherewithal to keep body and soul together in a nice respectable fashionable modern sort of way her constancy shall certainly be rewarded he will go straight down to the court and declare her to the sentiments that have been warming his breast silently all these past months what a dear girl she is and so fond of him that in itself is an extra charm in her very delightful character and those fortunate thousands quite a quarter of a million isn't it well of course no use saying they won't come in handy no use being hypocritical over it horrid thing a hypocrite well those thousands naturally have their charm too he rose flung his cigarette aside it was finished as far as careful enjoyment would permit and rang for his servant to pack his portmanteau he was going to the court by the morning train now that he is here however he restrains the ardor that no doubt is consuming him with altogether admirable patience and waits for the chance that may permit him to lay his valuable affections at joyce's feet a dinner to be followed by an impromptu dance at the court suggests itself as a very fitting opportunity he grasps it yes to-morrow evening will be an excellent and artistic opening for a thing of this sort all through luncheon even while conversing with joyce and miss maliphant on various outside topics his versatile mind is arranging a picturesque spot in the garden enclosures wherein to make joyce a happy woman lady swansdown glancing across the table at him laughs lightly always disliking him she has still been able to read him very clearly and his determination to now propose to joyce amuses her nearly as much as it annoys her frivolous to the last degree as she is an honest regard for joyce has taken hold within her breast lord baltimore too is disturbed by his brother's present End of chapter 43 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.